So Gay Gaddis, founder, author, artist, trailblazer. Gay Gaddis is the founder of T3, an innovative digital and marketing agency that rose to national prominence under her leadership for over 30 years. It was acquired by LRW Group in 2019. As an active spokesperson, artist, and writer, Gaddis is the celebrated author of Cowgirl Power, How to Kick Ass in Business and Life, and is a regular contributor to Forbes and part of Fortune's Powerful Women Insider Network. She's received numerous awards, including the University of Texas Macomb School of Business 2020 Hall of Fame, the Liz Carpenter Lifetime Achievement Award, Fast Company's Top 25 Women Business Builders, Inc. Magazine's Top 10 Entrepreneurs of the Year, a few other things, an executive committee member of the University of Texas Alumni Association, Texas Exes. As an artist, Gay's bold and vibrant paintings have been shown in several prestigious galleries around the country and featured by Texas Monthly Magazine, naming Gaddis as one of the top 10 artists to collect now. Gaddis and her husband own and operate the Double Heart Ranch in the Texas Hill Country, which houses their most recent endeavor, Fossil Ridge Creative Center, which is a retreat venue for thinking, creating, creativity, and collaboration. Kim Barnes is gonna be our moderator today. Kim has spent over 30 years on the air. Now as Barnes Team Media, she and her husband, Mike Barnes, coach clients for on-camera impact for your virtual presentations, video, media interviews, and public speaking. Kim was an award-winning reporter and news anchor for 15 years, including more than a decade at KVU in Austin. So Kim, I'm now gonna turn the program over to you. Well, Sheila, I'm so glad to be here and so glad to be here with Gay as well. We were joking earlier that we could probably talk all day. We won't, but we have so many great questions that we want to just have this conversation with Gay. She is such a great example of the grit and resilience that is required to be successful, especially in a time like we are living today. So Gay, so glad to be with you. And let's just start with the fact that you founded T3, you led it over 30 years, grew it into the largest female owned advertising agency. Did you intend necessarily, as you tell the story a little bit of how it began to, did you ever think about, oh, I wanna do this because I want to be a trailblazer? You know, did you anticipate that when you thought, okay, I need to start this company? No, actually, I started the company in 1989. And for any of you who can dial back those many years ago, we were in a very deep recession uh, in that time frame, late 80s. Uh, Texas was particularly hurt. Uh, um, we had gone through a really difficult time where our savings and loans failed. The real estate wasn't worth the dirt it was built on, and it was just a tough time. So I started the company out of kind of the, the ashes of that and really wasn't thinking about, oh, we're going to grow, we're going to be this. And people used to always ask me, so in five years, how big are you going to be and what are you going to do? And I was always looking at what are we going to do today to be the best we can be? Uh, and I was just in survival mode, to be honest. And failure was just not an option. So starting the company in 89 was just a time when uh, we were all kind of trying to just like today, you know, trying to figure out how we were going to make the best of it. Uh, and so my view of it was to do a great job for our clients and grow incrementally. And I certainly wanted to grow because I always believed that growth was the engine that kept things going, but never, ever dreamed that we would be where we ended up. <laughs> right. Well, I think some people start a business because they have these great vision or these great plans of, I want it to be this where it sounds like for you, it was just, this just seems like a good idea. And wow, maybe didn't have the, never anticipated that it would grow to be what it became. No, I really didn't. But I did have a concept and I did have inspiration for starting the company because I watched the advertising industry and it was either very, very much on the creative art side, you know, winning awards and all that, or very much on the analytics side of just research and kind of blocking and tackling and some direct mail programs that weren't pretty, they weren't cool, but they got results. So I wanted to marry the art and the beauty with the results. And that's what we started doing from the very beginning. And it started to differentiate ourselves. 
And I've, I love the story that you cashed in an IRA to start your company and how going from that, how did you continue to fund it? You never took outside investors. No, I didn't. I, and this is really, you look back on it and how hilarious in a way or crazy was it that I could go and cash in a $16,000 IRA and start my company on that, mm -hmm. which is unbelievable, you know, but it also shows that it didn't take a lot of money to start an ad agency back then. I had a very small office, uh, very little technology, and it was just a couple people. And so that's all we needed. But I did have three clients. And so that started to help fund us. And I never did take in any outside money. And because I was really concerned about the control factor and I wanted to control my business. So we worked with clients and they really funded us basically. And uh, sometimes Kim, through the years, what we would do is look at very, we look at more aggressive pricing strategies with clients who are willing to sign up for a year long program uh, and give us more of, it was just like, you know, a guarantee almost that every month we would have this much coming in for a set scope of work. And all of our clients weren't like that, but I put clients on retainers very early with, uh, again, sometimes aggressive pricing. And that's what allowed us to keep funded without taking in the outside money or investors or, you know, even um, um, bank loans or that sort of thing. So definitely, I guess, thinking of how can I be creative in a way to be able to have, know that you have that money coming in without having to go to outside investors or looking for other ways. So it sounds like you just always looked for ways to be able to use your creativity. Uh, I always find it so interesting that you were an art, an art major in college. Yeah. yeah, well, that's just, you know, that's what we'll talk about my art career in a few minutes. But yeah, you know, being an art major is interesting. And so I will tell everyone, though, that I have a BFA in studio art, studio art from the University of Texas, which was a very, very rigorous program in studying art and drawing and painting and, and sculpting and all those things. But I went back to school at night fairly early on after I graduated because I immediately realized I didn't understand the language of business. Mm. And so I almost got my MBA and that story got changed because I got pregnant and there were no night in executive programs in mm. Austin when I came back. So I, I, I missed the last hours of my MBA, but I did take enough business courses to, I would say, understand, you know, what it took to run a business, what it was like. And I could understand our clients better and at one point most of our clients were publicly traded companies and so I was really really involved in kind of the quarterly earnings part of it and really listening to uh, what the stock market was doing with those clients and how we could help change them so it's a good thing that I did go back to school for that but because I was a little bit behind when it comes to just basic accounting and understanding finance and economics and, and all the thing marketing. And certainly we are in a time in our, in our world today of just change and challenge. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how you would handle change that you came across uh, as the business owner, as well as maybe it's just a, you know, some challenges that you went through specifically in your, in your business. Several. Um, first of all, you know, if you're in business that long, you rode the roller coaster of the economy. And so we went through some pretty, pretty serious recessions during that time. Uh, I will never forget, as we won't, I mean, most people in this audience will never forget what we all went through in that 2008-9 period. And for us, it was particularly difficult because two things happened. One is I lost my biggest client because I didn't agree to sell the business. And Dell had been a client for 16 years. And one day they came in and said, look, if you don't sell to the holding company advertising agency that we're going with, then you're out. And I said, we're out. I'm not going to sell the company. So it was horrible, Kim. I mean, that was $70 million worth of revenue that we walked away ouch. from in one day. Yeah, ouch. It, it almost killed me. It was the most difficult decision and difficult move I ever made as a business owner. Uh, and then, you know, here we were going into this recession. I have to tell you, though, I had to stick to my ethics and my morals and my values. And I knew it wasn't the right time to sell the business under those circumstances. So we did a very elegant exit strategy with Dell, three months uh, of, of getting out of that business. And the good news was though, 
that because we had been with Dell for so many years and had a paying client, so I thank Dell, you know, for this, uh, that helped us move aggressively into online, internet, all things digital. And so we were very, very ahead, much ahead of the, the rest of uh, most of our competitors mm -hmm. because of it in that space. So I was able to go out and parlay our knowledge that we had learned at Dell with other major companies around the country. And I worked really hard to go sell the business, but we were able to do it. And again, made it through that whole year without borrowing any money, without going under. We actually made a small profit that year, which was unbelievable, but it was tough. I'm not going to kid you. I mean, you know, laugh and tell everyone that I'm a blonde today because about two weeks after that, I had dark hair and it turned white. I, <laughs> I was, it was horrible. I mean, I really went through a major shock, but we just bared down and we got through it. And my team came through and, and we pitched business and, and, and made it work. But, you know, that, that was a very tough time. And not only was the Dell business, you know, we were losing that, but then you get into these recessions and in the advertising world, many times the marketing budgets mm -hmm. and the advertising dollars are the first to get cut. You know, if you're a major company or any kind of company and you start looking at your, your balance sheet and your money and what you're spending, mm -hmm. you're going to produce your product first. You're going to keep the, the, you know, the factory lines moving, but you're not necessarily going to fund all those marketing programs and they become nice, but not necessary. So we would get budget cuts, the first ones, and I would usually tell my other colleagues in, in business and whatever, I'm saying, get get ready because we're about to hit a recession because I just got some cuts. And so we were like the bellwether for mm -hmm. I could always tell what was going to happen. Um, and a lot of times not only would they cut our budgets, but they would eliminate some of our clients too. So those were tough times to go through. But then, you know, in the good times, we were able to ride it high. And one of the things that helped us in these recessions, those later recessions, is what I was talking about. And that is that we knew how to make money on the internet and we knew how to take companies who had spent a lot of money in traditional advertising, which was television, radio, print, you know, all the traditional means and move them quickly into online sales. And so because of that, our budget started getting funded faster. And while other advertising budgets were getting cut, we would start funneling the money into what our programs were because we could measure the results. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty compelling. So that's how we got through it. From all that you've learned, what advice would you give to leaders who are in this challenging business environment and are really struggling with, you know, even though we've been doing this, you know, since March, if you will, but yeah. still things are changing and maybe didn't, we thought this was sort of a short term and now we know it's going to be a longer term. What advice would you give to, to leaders today? Well, this is pretty tough. I'm going to give you some tough advice and I have to take my own medicine because I'm a rancher as you mentioned and yesterday was one of those days that was almost like when I had to cut my staff for some reason and uh, we called our longhorn longhorn herd yesterday and it, it breaks your heart sometimes because you know you get kind of attached to some of these creatures and uh, but to be the best and to really always continue to look for you know the characteristics you want and the best longhorns you can't allow the ones that are not best to stay in your herd. Now they may go to another herd or they may end up, you know, on someone's table, dinner table someday. And it sounds pretty cruel, but you know, if you're really going to be good, you've got to make tough decisions. Mm -hmm. And you know, what I've seen a lot of times happen is when you go in a recession or you go in a downtime, a lot of leaders are sometimes hesitant to make the cuts mm -hmm. when they need to. And so they will hold on to staff or poor performers way too long because it seems so cruel or so hard or so difficult and you don't want to do it. But those are the things that you have to really, you know, sharpen your pencil and look at. And what I've always found is that other people on your team know the ones who are really pushing and working hard and making it work through change and through tough times. And they know the ones who are, are not holding up their end of the bargain. And it brings the whole team down. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, this is kind of tough love, but, you know, you need to go through and make sure that you've got the best people to move you forward. And uh, if you don't, you need to make some of those tough decisions because it just draw, it just sucks your bottom line. And, uh, uh, you know, you've, you've got to do it. It's hard, but you have to do it. 
So as you're having to make these really tough decisions, whether it's staff or programs, or other or, things, other cuts, like, yes. How, how do you, how, what, what, what advice would you give as far as how do you get the rest of your staff to kind of buy into those changes or the, the things that are going to be different moving forward? Well, I had this theory, and it's not really a theory because I put it in practice, and that is in every organization, even if it's small, there are people that I call influencers who are inside the organization, and they may have, if like if you're the leader or you're the CEO, you don't always get the real story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> people will protect you. People will tell you sometimes what they think you want to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's these people that are inside an organization who have the ear and the trust of the staff and people tell them things and they have a lot of influence on how the organization is going to move forward. And so to create a respectful environment, you know, uh, I always tried to create a company and still do where people respect each other and trust each other so that you can move forward and especially in tough times. But look to the influencers and if I ever wanted to make a change, I would go to those people in the organization, take them one by one and talk to them about uh, and just get their counsel and their buy-in basically on what I thought we needed to do to move the organization forward. And if we had to make some tough decisions or if we were gonna make a change of some sort or add a new service or something, um, many, many changes, I would bring those people in and get them on board. Then I knew that they would go back in and go from the ground up and permeate the organization. Mm -hmm. So by the time that I would announce a change or have to make a cut or have to make, uh, let's say we're opening a new office or whatever it was, mm -hmm. uh, I knew that there was a groundswell already of supporters and I wasn't just coming in with a hard message. Mm -hmm. And so I always say, go find your influencers and bring them on board and bring them along. Mm -hmm. They're kind of doing a little, little of the work behind the scenes, if you will, for mm -hmm. you. And people trust and listen to them. So you got to take that into account. Well, and I and I've heard you say that that uh, a quote that you um, you eat, like to eat risk for breakfast, um, <laughs> and 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 I wonder, do you feel like that's something that is almost was just innate to you, so that you know when you think of having grit and resilience, do you feel like that's something that that people sort of either have or don't, or do you think that it can be learned? Both, both. Um, Part of my risk taking came is because I had to. Uh, my father passed away when I was 13 and I started working when I was 13. I got a job. And so I was always a bit at risk financially mm -hmm. for a long time because my mom was a elementary school teacher. She had owned a kindergarten. She was an entrepreneur also, but she got out of that because she needed the, um, the benefits and, and the assuredness of a, a paycheck. But, you know, let's go to that. An elementary school teacher back in the 60s and 70s wasn't making a lot of money. So I always felt at risk to keep us afloat. And so that was something that was just kind of I got dealt that hand, you know. And so I began to say, okay hey, if I take this risk, then I can do that one. So what I'm saying it can be learned mm -hmm. is that certain things force us to take risks. We don't have a choice. We have to survive. But other times, if you take incremental risk, it mm -hmm. gives you confidence that you're not just taking a wild guess or a wild risk. It's a calculated risk. Mm -hmm. And um, there's another little phrase that I want to uh, tell everyone today. And that is when I first started my company, I, I did tell my mother-in-law this. I said, guess what? I feel like I'm eating risk for breakfast every day. And she showed me on this table in her, her living room this wonderful little enamel box and on it, it just said, everything is sweetened by risk. And she said, I want you to have this. And so it still sits on my desk today. And what it taught me and what she was trying to say by giving me this is that if you don't take some of these risks, you're going to miss out on the sweet stuff. Mm -hmm. And I kind of would learn that, okay, maybe all the risk I took didn't pay off the way I thought they would, or it didn't work out exactly the way I thought it would. But because of that, I learned something. I learned how to make quick corrections mm -hmm. and fix things. And so taking a risk doesn't always work out the way you want, but it's also, if you don't do it, you're not going to find out and you learn. So it's, it's kind of two things. I, maybe it's part innate, but we learn it as we go, if you'll take those risky steps sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if you're always safe and you're always playing the safe game, you're never going to get the sweet stuff. 
And I guess just the confidence that you see from making making one of those risks and seeing it be successful, or I guess, you know, we've, I've heard the phrase before, you don't fail, you learn, uh, yeah. that, that you figure That's out right. the, the ways to move forward. Uh, you also have a philosophy of the diversity of thought. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, today, more than ever, we hear about the importance of diversity, and there are many forms of diversity. Uh, of course, many are, you know, ethnic diversity, gender diversity, on and on, you know, we could racial diversity, just all different kinds of diversity. But I've always had a philosophy that goes way back to when I started my company, that we had to have a diversity of thought. And so I initiated the Myers-Briggs type indicator from the beginning with my company and I knew everyone's Myers-Briggs type and they all knew each other's. And so what the reason was you would wanna make sure that the teams were not all the same type or not the same personality type because when you're the same personality type, you think alike a lot. You will react to something the same way. You don't ask the tough questions if you're one type, you may if you're another type. So when you mix those teams together with people of different personality types and different backgrounds and different ways of thinking, that's where the innovation comes in. That's where the cool stuff happens. And you allow people because of, I, like I said, if they trust each other and respect each other and know that, guess what? Joe's going to come out this differently than I am and I need to listen to that. And then the good stuff ha happens, like I said. But if everyone is the same, and, and I want to say this, look around your teams because it is very easy to surround yourself with people that are a whole lot like you. It's fun. Like, I'll just tell everybody, I'm an extrovert, I'm an ENTP, and I love hanging out with other ENTPs. We have a great time together. But I cannot imagine building a company of all ENTPs that would have been a disaster. So always trying to make sure that we balance that and have people with different types come in to surround you. And I also said as a leader that I know my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what they are, and they're pretty big ones. But if you have someone who comes at it with that different personality type, that different way of looking at things, that shores up your weaknesses. And I can do something for them that shores up their weaknesses. And so by putting everything together, you end up with a, which a much more, uh, much more aggressive, I will say, also much more challenged and much more innovative team. And I would guess also more effective in the long run because you're coming up with all those different ideas where, where it's maybe more fun to be around the people that you know how to interact with better, but maybe not as effective. Yeah. Yeah. And it also is really what's good for conflict resolution too. Um, because let's say, you know, I don't see things the way that Jane sees something, but if I really looked at it and even our HR people could help them say, well, look at her personality type. She, she needs time to think about that and she's not going to react as quickly as you do but let her have a chance to do that and then you're going to see her point of view so it really helped us a lot with just uh, basic you know conflict resolution as well as building strong teams yeah and understanding where people are coming from because we always feel like well i don't understand what's wrong with them because if they don't think the same way we do that we, we well and on the flip them. side we all have customers everybody's got customers i call mine clients but we all have customers and our clients have customers and you can take it to the bank that your client base doesn't have the same they're not all the same personality as your company or whatever so you've got to listen to that too and bring in you know that thinking around how you're going to present to them or how you're going to work with them or how you're going to develop that relationship based on the fact that they're coming at things differently than some people on your team Talk a little bit about just during the pandemic and the changes and the challenges that you have faced in in, in what you're doing now well, you know, here we are. <laughs> right. We're doing this as a virtual event. It had been planned to be live uh, starting the middle of March. Every one of my live speaking engagements, all of our uh, conferences, all of our programs went dark and everything got postponed, canceled, changed. And so we immediately just decided, okay, so we've got to work with this the way we can. And everyone adapted really quickly with these virtual programs and our universities had to and, and everyone, all companies. And so we just said, all right, we're going to plug in that way. So I've continued to do my work. I've continued to do leadership training. I've continued to be able to make speeches and touch people. 
it bothers me in a lot of ways because I love the live interaction with an mm -hmm. audience and I mm -hmm. think it it changes the dynamic and I really like meeting people and hearing from them and talking to them before and after an event. What I will say though, it's the silver lining on this is that I've been able to touch more lives this way because we just recently did an event in London and had I gone there in person, like I probably would have, it was, we were able to broadcast it out over everyone around the world that works for that company. Mm -hmm. So we had a much larger participation than we would have had it been just the people they were gonna bring in for the annual event in London. So it's, it's, it's actually spread the reach in many ways, it made me kind of think about, okay, I'll produce my own live webinars. And we did. And we were able to affect people all through the summer and the early fall doing that. Um, I think some people are having kind of fatigue with this whole thing, you know, and getting tired of it. But um, hopefully when we can mix in the real in-person events, we can still keep a piece of this because it will allow us to do some in-between bridge training or some in-between meetings where so we'll have some breaks between it, hopefully. But I think we'll always stick with some of this. It's going to change us forever. Oh, I absolutely believe that to be true for sure. Because when, when you can just be in a meeting and training in a, at an event in London from your, without having to, you know, just walk across the house, it mm -hmm. makes so many things more available to people and, and more accessible to people. So I, 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 we do miss the, the, the extroverts of us do miss the in-person, but I think that there's going to be a piece of this that can be super effective uh, moving forward. And it sounds like you've gotten creative in the ways that you can continue to reach people by doing some of this virtually as well. Yeah. Let, let's switch and talk a little bit about your book. Uh, what made you just think, okay, I want to get all this down on in, in writing? What, what was the, you know, kind of the, the reasoning behind it? A few years ago, I was invited to uh, Tampa and they were looking for a woman who had built a business from the ground up. And so they searched far and wide and they looked around and they found me. And so I addressed about a thousand people at this chamber event in Tampa. And, uh, but they were looking for a woman who had built a business. And all of a sudden it really hit me that, you know what? Mm -hmm. this there's some a unique story here and uh there are not that many women who did what i did um and i need to tell that story i need to tell the lessons i learned i need to explain the story so i started off on that and then i realized that you know i'm an old cowgirl <laughs> uh, i grew up in east texas and i uh, was riding horses by the time i was five and working cattle with my godfather when i was a kid and grew up on a horse have a relationship with that and i always loved cowgirls uh, so i went to the cowgirl museum in fort worth mm -hmm. and if any of you ever get a chance to go there it is well worth the trip it's a beautiful museum and uh, very well done and i became acquainted with some of these women who lived in the late 1800s and competed in rodeos and wild west shows with against men into the 1930s in the 30s they split up and the men said they weren't going to compete with the women anymore because too many women were getting hurt but I don't think that was really the reason. I think a lot of women were winning, but they were tough women. They were really gritty and they had interesting stories too. So I decided in the beginning of each chapter of my book, I would put a little tiny vignette of some of these historic women because I didn't want their stories to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the movie that came out a few years ago, Hidden Figures, where there mm -hmm. was these women at NASA who had done some pretty amazing things, but no one knew about them until someone said, wow, Let's shine a light on them. So I didn't want my cowgirls to be forgotten. And I wanted just to say, look, can you imagine what they went through? They went through the Spanish flu. They went through the toughest of times. They were in incredible uh, adverse situations, but they were strong people. They were show people. They kept performing. They kept going. They were the first international female superstars from the United States. And so let's talk about them and if we could learn a little bit from them and their grit and their determination maybe we can kind of keep powering through whatever adversity we have so that's why they're there and really makes your book so unique because it's got the mix of of your your life's work but also the the great stories of them as well yeah, that was a challenge. My husband said, how in the world are you going to shoehorn these cowgirl <laughs> stories into your story of starting an ad agency in your life story? And I said, no, I'll do it. I promise you I'm going to make it work. And I did. And it, it's it's been fun. 
Well, and I love that you, after selling your, after selling T3, after all of those years, have kind of reinvented yourself again and gone back to your, your art, your artist roots. I have, uh, you know, in 2014, I picked up a paintbrush again, and that was tough. You know, when you, when you are trained to do a certain thing, uh, and that was kind of my, was potentially my life work, but it never was because I needed to make money and I went in the advertising business because of it and the rest is history. But I picked up a paintbrush again in 2014 and I fell in love with it again. And it was hard, hard work though. I really worked hard for months and months and months. And then it's a long story and we don't have time to tell it, but I ended up, it's a very long story, but I ended up with this one woman show in New York, which was incredible. And um, had affirmation at that point that people like my work and so one thing's led to another I've sold a lot of work uh, I've become a real working artist I love it mm -hmm. and another silver lining of this pandemic is it's given me a different sense of time and place and so I've spent a lot of time at my ranch which is where I paint anyway uh, big skyscapes and landscapes and um, so I've had time to really focus on my work and think about it more and I've gotten better I think mm -hmm. um, and it always takes hard work the more hard work you do the better you get and so I've done that and I've really uh, shifted a lot of my leadership training into some really robust corporate programs we've been doing uh, a lot of work for corporations and uh, leadership training internally for them and uh, some of my other speeches and webinars so you know, I've figured it out in some ways and uh, would be glad to be back out there amongst all of you again someday but uh, for now we've we've just tried to adapt and make it work and we can see some of your beautiful artwork behind you, can't we? Yeah. yeah, and we do virtual tours, and I've sold a lot of work with people coming out. We distance and let them look around, and then also virtual tours, so it's been uh, pretty amazing. And, and probably something that you would never have maybe thought of as an artist, that that might be a way that you would show people your art would be, hey, let never. me take you on, let me get you on my phone, and we'll walk around and look at the artwork. Yeah, never in a million years, because I was always, you know, of the, of the feeling that, you had to be in the presence of a piece of art to to want to buy it, you know, mm -hmm. or to appreciate it. You have to be in the physical presence of it. But I've been amazed that pe people are, are, you know, or can see them pretty well. And I can get real close and show the little <laughs> detail and, and all the stuff. And, and so it's been pretty incredible how we sell work that way. Big ones too, big paintings. Yeah, yeah, they're beautiful. And as you think of the, what, you know, kind of, from T3 and being an artist and still doing leadership training and all of that, do, would you have a sense of what's next for you? Yeah, uh, yeah actually, I, I'm going to have an announcement in the spring that's going to be a, a, a bigger piece to the leadership training. I wish I could tell you today, but we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. So there'll be a, a pretty exciting chapter of that as it takes on on a new new role um, and you know I'm, I'm really kind of wanting to continue just really focusing on what I'm doing but I'll, I've got another book in my back pocket that I'm really need to double down on and work on it's um, I think it would be a really good it's not necessarily a sequel but it's it's a, a deep dive into one piece of it that I think is important for people on their lives so uh, probably another book at some point uh, and those are a lot of work mm. and I have to tell everyone if you haven't written a book it's it's work it's very hard work and to not it's not self-published I mean I went through the largest publisher in the world and it was a, a, a very strenuous process let's say that um, so I'm willing to do it again because I, I think I do have another book in me um, but and the other thing about my book is I wrote it myself and you may laugh and say, well, of course you wrote the book. Mm -hmm. But if you really do an analysis, a lot of business books that are out there, they have ghost writers who write the books because a lot of people can't write. I mean, they mm -hmm. have a great story, but they can't really write the, the book in, in a form that's acceptable. So I wrote every word of it. Uh, I knew that if I, I, if I was going to tell my stories, no one else could tell them like me. So I, I did it. And um, it's, again, it's hard work, but it's worth it, you know. It's good. What advice would you give to people? Because you have had, you know, multiple reinventions, if you will. All, you know, what, what advice <laughs> well, would you Madonna, give? Madonna, you know. Yeah, well, no, and, 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 yeah but, but, but all make, make very good sense for what you've done. But, you know, what, what advice would you give to somebody who is, you know, kind of has that urge or, 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 or maybe out of necessity because they've perhaps lost their job or have found themselves in a different situation and, and, and are, are having to reinvent themselves? You know, what advice would you give to them? 
really look back and what I've done and, and when I started tracing all the things that I've actually done well, because there's a lot of things I don't do well and, and I know what those are too. So you just try to say, okay, I'm not going to do that. But if you go back, go back to your childhood and think back about the things that brought you joy. Think of the things that you enjoyed doing or that you were good at or that maybe your coach or your teacher encouraged you to do because those are the things that start to stick with you and build who you are. So I was always a good little artist. I started painting when I was three and, you know, I got awards in high school and I, you know, and I ended up majoring in art. So being an artist was something that started as a very, very, very early in my childhood. Being able to speak uh, in public was very early in my childhood. I was doing plays and starring in plays and doing things from the time I was in the first grade. And so it's, these are the things that you go back. Well, maybe what was your superpower? You know, what was your strength as a child? And what were you good at? And kind of follow those threads and you'll be amazed at how it sticks with you. And those are the things that you're gonna do well as an adult. And then in that next iteration. So when I look at what I'm gonna do next, it's probably gonna be built on successes that I've already had. Mm -hmm. So rather than saying I reinvented myself, I really just, it is a reinvention of a childhood strength mm -hmm. really. And so all of us have that. And you know, maybe you were great at sports or, so how do you pivot that into something else or do something with that or use that to even help other people? And one thing I haven't mentioned much today is the greatest joy I've had as an entrepreneur were two things and that was giving people jobs mm -hmm. I loved to create jobs I thought it was a, a great uh, ability to be able to have a company mm -hmm. where people could work and, and earn a living for their families mm -hmm. and I have another thing that Sheila kind of mentioned a few minutes ago about you know having the baby and all that stuff I had a program called t3 and under where I allowed over there were over well over 110 babies that went through this program uh, during my time and that was where moms and dads could bring their infants to the office and we just all took care of them you know, <laughs> until they were ready to go off and crawl and go to you know to school and in, 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 in nine months to a year so those are two things that are kind of signature things that made being an entrepreneur worth it and that I'm I'm most proud of really mm -hmm. because when you're the boss you can you can create programs like that and you can have the ability to be able to impact people in that way yeah, you can do what you want. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, I see that we have some questions coming in. So okay. you ready for a few uh, for a few questions? Yeah, Let's I love see. it. <clears throat> Somebody asks, what are your thoughts on someone merging no script humor into a business news show? Education, business tips towards the end of the show, plus entertainment. The show focuses on delivering news in a comedic way rather than a bland, straightforward format. Oh, if you could pull that off, I think that would be delightful. I mean, we are just so, I don't know, the news, especially during all this has been so somber in some ways. And, you know, you, it's just politically polarizing. It's downward this and jobless and violence and defunding police. I mean, there's just so many things that are out there that really just kind of bring you down. And mm -hmm. if you listen to the news, and you read the news, it's kind of hard to get cheery. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's, and, and I'm a news person. I really like to try to keep up with what's going on, but I have to admit, I have to, you know, tamper that with a, a bit of, um, Breath, you know, levity in some way. So if someone could bring this forward, I know some things aren't funny, you know, and some things aren't humorous that happen. And when people are dying or, you know, that, that's not funny, but, um, but there's got to be a way to deliver news. And, and, you know, I've seen it in the past, sometimes our, our, our radio hosts through the years and sometimes could, could, turn a joke on something that you know would make you laugh and you know a current event or something and just see the humor in it so uh, anytime you can do that I think that's a it's a great gift if you can make it work and I would I, I'll tune in <laughs> <laughs> well here's another question as a leader <clears throat> if you are someone who doesn't like conflict mm -hmm. what maybe is the best way to be able to get past that fear of conflict to, to be able to address the issues that you need to well, there's different ways around that. Um, if you really, really innately do not like conflict, and that is just in some people's DNA, uh, it's just the way you're wired up, then you've got to find a partner that you mm -hmm. trust who will take it on. And, um, you know, I, 
I, I'm good at some things. Like I said, I'm not good at other things. Um, but literally, there are people who just, I, I have someone in my family, he will walk away from that rather than face it head on. And so instead of just saying, okay, well, I'm never going to get into a, a situation, because sometimes conflict is good. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it forces mm -hmm. us to discuss the differences it forces us to look at both sides of something and so but if you really hate it and you're really not good at it but you've got to partner with somebody who'll be that tip of the sword on that and then you know you do something else for them but you can't avoid it uh really because you, you won't grow but but you don't always have to be the one that's right in the middle of it because it may just make you sick almost you know it, it, you can't do the things over and over that you're not good at mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, here's another question. What are your non-negotiables for maintaining balance and how do you manage success and stay charged at the same time? Hmm. The non-negotiables for staying balanced. Yeah, I don't believe that there's great balance, but I really don't. I think you're sometimes all in this or all in that. And mm -hmm. it's just the pendulum swings, boom, boom. And you have to be willing to move those, you know, move with that. So, um, but, but I am getting to the point, and this is just a luxury at this point, where I try to not let things in my life that are going to be too negative or, you know, bring me down because it takes my focus off the positive things. That doesn't mean that I don't have, you know, unfortunate things to deal with, but you try to eliminate those and move on to the things that you do well and the things that bring you energy. So if you're focused on that, it does help charge you up. Because you're, when you're doing things you feel good about and that you're excited about and that's bringing you joy or that's bringing other people joy, and you flip that in a lot of ways. And what I said about giving other people jobs gave me a lot of energy and gave me a lot of reason to be. So a lot of things that we do that really bring us long-term satisfaction and keep us charged up is we're really doing it for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And even with my painting as much as I love to do that because I love the moment of creation the happiest thing for me is to see one of my paintings hanging in someone's home or office mm -hmm. and they always get back to me so you have to show me what they look like installed and so yeah it's great when they write me a check or it's great when I create this thing but the real joy is seeing it make someone else have a prettier space or a happy place or whatever so think about all the things you do and when you flip it on I call it the buckets of goodwill. What are you doing to fill those buckets of goodwill in your life? And if you're giving back, it just, it fills up your own buckets. You know, it's, it's like this, it's amazing. You know, the more you give, the more you get back. And that's the joy that really keeps me charged up. And going back to a little bit to the T3 and under that you created, was that something too, I would imagine that was a great uh, uh, way to keep your people and to, to but also was a, a great investment, obviously that's, it wasn't cheap, I'm sure, to be able to create that environment and be able to maintain that. Yeah. Were, did you do it as a way because you just felt like this is the way I can invest in my people? And are there other t examples that you can think of, of ways that people can invest in their people to keep them happy and, mm -hmm. and uh, more productive? I mean, that was something we did out of necessity. You know, I had four women who got pregnant near the same time and they were all key to the business. So I had to come up with something mm -hmm. and I didn't want to lose them. So that was, that was born out of that, but it also did have a big cultural uh, meaning because people then got the message that on many fronts, we were willing to do things to understand that people have a life and there's more to it than just what's going on at the office every day. So we tried to do things so that people felt like they, you know, could have time with their families or could do things outside of work that, that made them more well-rounded. And um, one of the things that I always really looked at is I hated to see somebody who had a lot of potential who was stuck, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I would try to force them to move on another team or help them get some training or do something to really help them realize their potential and then just watch them bloom because some people would kind of get, get to an impasse and they really wouldn't get to onto that next level they needed to go to so we I would always look at them and say well how can we charge them up and get them onto that next thing and then if you watch them bloom and grow and and they did then they would stay with you most mm -hmm. many of them for many years because if you were always looking at their 
career, tra you know, trajectory and how they could grow in the organization, then that was exciting. And, and they were willing to, to take those next steps and take those risks themselves. But that's also a reason why I felt the pressure always to grow the business. Mm -hmm. Because if we weren't growing and we weren't bringing in new opportunities and funding these things through accelerated growth, then I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and one thing I always tell everybody, even in a great year, even in great times, just count on the fact you may lose up to 20% of your business every year for mm -hmm. whatever for whatever reason. It can be economic change. It can be a client moves. It can be many, many things that would uh, cause you to have to lose some business. So we were always saying, if, we, if you want to grow 15% a year, you're going to have to grow 35% basically because you're going to lose something's going to fall out of the bottom so that growth engine was extremely important to me because uh, just safeguarding against the loss for one thing and then also giving those new opportunities to people through growth it sounds like so much of your just your core belief is caring about people and really being seeing looking for people's strengths and looking for ways to help them succeed which I think as a business leader is so important to, to that, that you have to look at your employees as not just numbers or, or filling positions, but really as people, because it sounds like that you really spent a lot of time thinking about that this, these, this person might be better served here or might be, which in turn helps the business too, though, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. you know, when I was talking earlier about culling the herd or, you know, kind of taking out. So those are important things because you can't grow an organization if you have people bringing it down. And the other piece of that too is I was known through the years to fire clients too. And uh, we didn't do it very often, but you have to really be mindful of that because if you have any piece of business or any customer or anything that you're working with that is truly not good for the organization, bringing people down, mm -hmm. not carrying their weight, not communicating well, not healthy for the organization, you need to kindly, and I will say that because you don't want to burn a bridge, but kindly sever that relationship. Mm -hmm. And even though it can be painful at the time because you, well, I'd love that income, but mm -hmm. I don't love what's happening to the organization. I've already lost three people because of it. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to make those tough cuts as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's up. And then, like you said, it goes back to, you know, I didn't want to abuse my people. And if I saw clients that were abusing my people over and over, and I couldn't fix it, they had to go. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was, me, you know, me kind of maybe protecting the organization in that way, too. Yeah, awesome. Well, if anybody has a last minute question, uh, we're about out of time. I know we could probably go on all afternoon. Gay, will you share a little bit about how people can stay connected with you? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I have an, a, a new website that's out. It's uh, www.gaygaddis.com. You can go there. You can connect in. It shows exactly how to sign up for my newsletter. I do a newsletter twice a month that shares little pearls of wisdom and gives some insights. Uh, so those come out. You can sign up for a newsletter. Uh, you can uh, see my art. You can uh, find out about some of my leadership training and all those things are on the website. So uh, we'd be glad to have you follow us on Instagram or, or you know, take a look at the website. And, and if you want to engage, we'd love to talk to you. And if you have any ideas for us or uh, have any questions, just fire away at that. Yeah, definitely selling the company did not mean that you were slowing down. <laughs> no, and, and you know, one last thing is that, you know, th because of the pandemic, I haven't traveled like I did. You know, I told you I was traveling all the time, speaking and conferences and all that. And so I found this, at first it was kind of startling because I found a new bucket of time. Mm -hmm. You think about how much time we would spend driving to this meeting or getting on this airplane or getting to this A to B to C, and mm -hmm. it all took up hours out of your day. So I had more time so I could focus on mm -hmm. some things and really double down on them. So in a way, it gave me a gift of time back. Mm -hmm. And that's the most precious thing we have if you're trying to accomplish anything. So, so that's been a good thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, what a, what a privilege for all of us to get to hear from, from you and all your words of wisdom. And because definitely when we were thinking of, you know, grit and resilience, you <laughs> definitely embody that. So such a pleasure to be able to share just your insights with all of us. So thank you so much. 
Well, and I just want to have one last thing, and that is I have a great deal of respect for your organization. And I watch what's going on in Central Texas. And Westlake is in a catbird seat, really. I mean, you all have a wonderful community there. Uh, and calling your own kind of way, it's not Austin, <laughs> you know, if you're really in that community. And, and I think your chamber and what businesses can do to grow and flourish in your area is really amazing. And so you're in a good place. It's, and if you ride through the rest of this uh, <coughs> virus thing, I think you're going to be in a, a really great place to, to grow and succeed. So congratulations to all of you and for your hard work. Thank you, Gay. We, we agree with you. Westlake is a very special place. We're a tight-knit community. Oh, let's see if you says, can. I just got here. See you I think soon. someone needs to unmute or to mute themselves. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, so thank you, Gay. You are such an inspiration. I love listening to you. I, it's it's su so surprising to me that your education was actually, an, a, you were an art major versus <laughs> business or marketing. Um, I think it's phenomenal because it's kind of two sides of the brain and two ways of thinking. And I think it's phenomenal um, what you've accomplished. And we just um, are so grateful to you. Um, there is a link to your website in the chat. And you'll also be, all the attendees will be receiving an email later today um, as well with a link to her, her website. Um, but it does feature her art exhibitions, uh, leadership training, her webinars. So um, we're very grateful. Thank you, Gay. And also a big thanks to Kim Barnes, our moderator of Barnes Team Media. Uh, I can't tell you how many people actually uh, sent me messages saying, oh, Kim Barnes, she's so awesome. Uh, both Kim and Mark, uh, Mike, her husband, are uh, wonderful people to work with. Uh, I've actually uh, hired them uh, to give a plug to help the chamber um, coordinate um, our hy hybrid events. So how do we bring our Zoom events now to in-person to be able to offer it both remotely, our events both remotely and um, over Zoom. So they've been instrumental in helping me figure out which mics to use and which cables and how to connect what and all that. So um, they, you can, they can be hired for anything with regards to um, uh, our virtual living these days, um, online, any kind of online um, help that you need, as well as just plain leadership, uh, speaker uh, presentation training, uh, media training, on camera training. So um, they're a great resource for the Westlake Chamber. And then I'm just gonna go back to our, let's see, hopefully you can, um, I'm gonna share my slides because I want to share with you a little gift we wanna give to Gay and Kim today. Sorry, as I shuffle along here, let's see, there we go. Uh, if you can see that, Gay and Kim will each receive a pie from oh. Tiny Pies. Uh, we'll have that shipped out to you. They do amazing pies for the holidays and it's not just Tiny Pies. Um, they also do <laughs> full-size pies. So we're gonna give, give you each a full-size pie, but um, they're so great, they're great gifts and you can, um, you can purchase like little six packs of their tiny pies and choose all the different flavors that they have. And they're just a great, great gift idea. So uh, just as a token of our appreciation, um, we want to uh, give you a pie for the holidays. So be on the lookout I for that. I love that. I <laughs> love it. One of our, 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 our uh, new additions uh, to Westlake, a new business uh, this year. Um, I also, before we go, want to thank Sheila so much. Sheila Bostic, you're on somewhere. I, I, I don't think your camera's on, but hopefully you're listening to me that um, you've just done such a wonderful job as our chairman of the board for 2020. 2020, you know, stole her... <laughs> <laughs> stole her chairmanship from her this year. But what you don't know is she did so much behind the scenes. I mean, she is the ultimate cheerleader and face for the chamber. Um, but you know, unfortunately her face has been relegated to Zoom this year. But behind the scenes, she's been such a positive force for both myself and for our board and for our members. And I just can't think of a more perfect leader um, to take us through the pandemic. Uh, we had many plans this year that we had, uh, had had planned for for her year in 2020. We had to put them on hold, um, but we do expect to be able to roll them out in 2021 and beyond. And just I just wanted to make sure we gave that plug to Sheila and thank you so much for everything. Um, now for our raffle winner, um, because you stayed on to the very end, we did a little bit of a, um, a drawing here behind the scenes and I'm gonna award um, the winner to our raffle, you get a uh, 
Cowgirl Power, um, Kick Ass in Business and Life by Gay Gaddis. Uh, we'll be mailing that to you. And the winner is Anita Johnson. Anita is with the Rotary Club of Westlake. Congratulations, Anita. Um, we're excited to be able to send you your Cowgirl Power, How to Kick Ass in Business and Life. <laughs> uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close it. Thank you um, so much for joining us all. And everyone have a safe, safe holiday season. And we just look forward to 2021 and giving you all sorts of news and events that we've got coming back in both uh, virtual and in-person form. Um, so thank you for staying with us through 2020 and look forward to seeing you again in January. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. Goodbye. Thank you, Gay. Thank you, Kim. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Kim. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Kim. Great job. Bye. Bye.